Hello and welcome to the London Legal Podcast, presented by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. Our leading solicitors share their views on latest legal issues and developments, and how the law might affect you, because we care about righting wrongs and providing first-class personal legal services. So please enjoy this, the London Legal Podcast, presented by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the London Legal Podcast. My name is Brunel Menezes and I'm an Associate Solicitor in the Dispute Resolution Team at Hodge, Jones and Allen. I'm joined today by my colleague from the private client team, Josephine. Hello, I'm Josephine Russon and I'm an Associate Solicitor in the private client team at Hodge, Jones and Allen and an Associate Member of STEP, the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners. If you have listened to our previous episodes, you will know that we've had different solicitors across the firm look at a wide range of legal issues, focusing on matters that many Londoners face during their lifetimes. Nicola Waldman, a partner in our private client team, and Josephine previously spoke about making a will in relation to buying and selling a property and the tax implications of this. Following on from that episode, today we'll be looking at the circumstances in which a person may be able to contest a will. For those that don't know, a will is a document that sets out how you would like your estate to be dealt with on death and can include, for example, your funeral wishes or the appointment of guardians. A will is not a once and for all document. As a rule of thumb, we suggest that you review your will at every three years or on the occasion of a birth, marriage, death of a person named in your will. So contesting the will can add uncertainty and stress to an already difficult situation. The law intends to respect the wishes of the person who has died, even if this is not what the deceased friends and family were expecting. However, if you do wish to contest the will, there are a number of grounds on which this can be challenged. And these include, firstly, invalid execution. Second, lack of knowledge and approval. Three, lack of testamentary capacity. Four, undue influence. And five, fraud and forgery. This is a large area of law, but today we'll try and give you a brief summary of what is required and what to look out for. So let's start with invalid execution. The formalities surrounding the signing of a will are very inflexible. Perhaps, obviously, the will must be in writing. The person making the will must sign the document in the presence of two witnesses, who must then also sign and add their names. As a consequence of the pandemic, where face-to-face meetings with multiple households became difficult or were not allowed, the law has been temporarily amended so that it is now possible to witness a person signing their will by live video stream. However, the rules to comply with this are technical and should be avoided unless absolutely necessary, and so I would strongly encourage listeners to take formal legal advice before relying on video witnessing. So if you have any concerns that if any of these steps were not taken when a will was created, signed or witnessed, you may be able to challenge the will. One example which could lead to a challenge is if the deceased signed the will, but this was not done in the presence of their witnesses. I should also add that a beneficiary to a will, and this means a person who will benefit from the terms of the will, should never be a witness to that will, as this would result in that person losing their inheritance. So if we go on to the next round, that's lack of knowledge and approval. You may also hear this being referred to as want of knowledge and approval. So for a will to be valid, a person must have understood and approved of the contents. Whilst in most cases there is a presumption that the deceased knew and approved of the contents of the will, subject to them having the requisite testamentary capacity, there are certain circumstances in which it must be proved that the deceased had the required knowledge to understand the contents of their will and approve of that content. Yes, this can include if the deceased suffered from a serious illness or could not read or write, if the deceased could not speak the language in which the will was drafted, or if there were suspicious circumstances about how the will came to be made. If there are any suspicious circumstances about how a will came to be made, and then allegations for want of knowledge and approval is made, the party seeking to rely on the disputed will will need to provide proof as to the deceased's knowledge and approval. And I think this leads us nicely onto the next ground, which is lack of testament capacity. This is a huge topic, but in short, testamentary capacity is a legal term to describe a person's legal and mental ability to make their will. When we meet with clients in person or by video, we will ask several questions about their personal and financial circumstances to ascertain whether they have the capacity required to make a will. So to give you a bit of background, capacity is time and subject specific. Therefore, a person could have the capacity to make a will in the morning, but not in the afternoon, perhaps because of particular medication they're taking. 
Similarly, a person may have capacity to decide where they want to live, but not have capacity required to make a will. So we have to look at the specific decisions that the person is being asked to make. So the person making a will must understand that the document has the effect of carrying out their wishes on death. They must know the extent of their estate and what this consists of. They must be able to recall those who have claims on them and understand the nature of those claims so that they can include and exclude beneficiaries from the will. And lastly, they must not have a disorder or delusion that influences or prevents the exercise of his natural faculties. The judge has previously summed this up by saying that a person making their will has to be very generally in possession of their senses. Now, in most cases, it's clear when a person does or does not have capacity. But if there is any doubt, we would seek the opinion of a medical professional. This is one of the more common grounds on which wills are challenged, but are notoriously difficult to prove. Each claim is very fact specific. When investigating whether a challenge to a will can be made due to lack of testamentary capacity, as a solicitor dispute resolution, we would want to see what steps were taken by the will drafter to ascertain the capacity. We would also want to see the quality and content of any file notes the solicitor or will drafter has made, and if they had any concerns, and if so, what steps do they take? As you said earlier, Josephine, just because a person may not have capacity to make some decisions, this does not mean that they lack capacity to make others. This makes it very difficult to ascertain, and we would usually wish to see the deceased medical records. We would also want to speak to various friends, families, and neighbours, just to find out what they thought of the deceased behaviours and state of mind at the relevant time. I should stress it will be for the party challenging the will to prove that the deceased lack the requisite testamentary capacity. I guess we could also note that it may also be made more difficult at this time due to the pandemic, as parties may not be able to seek the relevant care required, and it will also be more difficult for will drafters to assess over a video call. Another complex area and difficult ground to prove is of undue influence. This is when someone who had power over the deceased use that power to coerce or force the will maker to change the will for their benefit. This usually comes up if there's a surprise beneficiary in the will, someone has unexpectedly been removed from the will, or one particular beneficiary has received an unexpected large gift. So the question to consider is, did the person making the will act as a free agent, or did someone else exert power over them which caused them to write the will in the terms that they did? This must be pressure so strong that it overbears the testator's free judgment causing them to succumb for the sake of a quiet life. What I'm really describing is coercion, and this goes much further than ordinary persuasion. A person may also be unduly influenced if their mind has been poisoned against someone that would otherwise be a natural beneficiary. For example, a daughter may spread lies about her brothers that causes a parent to cut them out of the will. Due to the nature of this ground, it's quite unusual or difficult to get direct or documentary evidence of undue influence as this usually occurs behind closed doors or one-to-one with the deceased, there aren't usually witnesses to this. Cases of this nature are usually decided based on witness evidence of the family and friends and beneficiaries, and the quality of that evidence, whether it be direct or circumstantial. It is likely that due to the pandemic, that cases of undue influence may rise as people are unable to access their full support network and may therefore be more susceptible to influence from anyone in a position of power or whom they may depend on who could then abuse that position. The final ground on which a will can be challenged is fraud or forgery, and this is not an allegation that should be made lightly. If the contents of the will or the signature of the person who made the will is forged, then the will is invalid. A fraudulent will can take many different forms. However, the most common case is where there are allegations that the deceased's last valid will has either been destroyed or hidden. In order to successfully argue that a signature on a will has been forged, it is essential that anyone investigating the claim obtain expert handwriting evidence which supports any allegation. The expert will need to have access to original copies of the deceased's handwriting and signature, ideally at the time the will was allegedly signed. The expert may also be able to do other tests to check the validity of the will. Forging a will is serious and may result in a criminal prosecution. So I think we both noticed that the number of people disputing wills is increasing year on year, which I believe is probably due to a number of factors, including the change in family dynamics and makeup, perhaps a rise in property prices, which is usually the main asset of an estate, and the growing awareness of the general public arising from some high profile cases in recent years but I'm sure we could talk for hours about this. I think we can, Josephine, but unfortunately that's all we have time for today. 
Thank you for joining me and thank you for all for listening to the London Legal Podcast. We hope you found our whistle stop tour on contesting a will enjoyable and useful. If you have any questions related to anything we've discussed today, please feel free to leave a comment or get in touch with us via our website. Thank you for listening to the London Legal Podcast, presented to you by Hodge Jones and Allen Solicitors. To listen to more podcasts, follow us on SoundCloud or visit our website www.hja.net for interesting opinions and the latest legal information. Or if you need our help, call 0808 2780 216.